to the show, I'm Temple Ashadu. Because on the show this morning, I'm going to the man joining us from Greenwich Merchant Bank. Thank you for coming through. Ali Kansaki of Rich Frontiers Management in Nairobi, Kenya. Thanks a great deal for your presence on the show this morning. Kosina Mofaye, Executive Editor here at Frontier Africa Reports. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on the program. Let's look at the status of the markets. Yes, from yesterday, Nigeria Stock Exchange is down by 22 business points. Um, the BRVM Stock Exchange in Ivory Coast opened the week positive by some 14 business points. You've got the Egyptian Stock Exchange down by some 0.60% on Monday. Kenya, the Nairobi Stock Exchange, there leaped again by some 27 business points, while Johannesburg Stock Exchange went lower by 0.94% on Monday. We move on now to the Eastern African headlines, where IFC, the International Finance Corporation, names Amina Arif as the new country manager for East Africa, Malawi. Kenya backs out from Somalia sea border case and wants African Union. Kenya mortgage refinance company credits lends, uh, lending to uh, creditors or to, to banks, financial institutions in that country uh, hit some 2.76 billion shillings. Uh, and of course, Ethiopia, we have uh, its switch getting some $2.3 million from the Africa Development Bank to diversify its digital services offerings. Mozambique's got four state-owned companies to undergo restructuring, something that they're getting one company to handle before the end of the year. We'll come to you quickly, Ali, with this headlines to help us make sense of what they imply for the markets. So um, let me start with the IFC announcement. The IFC is a big player here in East Africa, particularly Kenya. This is an important development. Um, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Diop, who was previously um, stationed in Kenya for the World Bank, is now the new leader of the IFC. So we're expecting uh, a continued uh, important uh, intervention um, by the IFC in this region and in Kenya in particular. Um, this uh, sea border case uh, is been causing a lot of furore. Um, Kenya withdrew uh, uh, from, from it. Um, Somalia is basically drawing a, uh, instead of drawing a straight line out, it's, it's drawing a line with the angle of the border, um, which Kenya feels is eating into Kenya's waters. Um, however, there has been a lot of backlash against Kenya's approach, which has been basically uh, not to present its case, uh, to say that there's been COVID and that, that they haven't been able to put it together. But now I think the Kenya strategy is coming out to the fore. They want to go to the African Union. We'll have to keep an eye on that. The important thing to note really is this is more than just a Kenya-Somalia issue. Um, we've got a whole bunch of geoeconomic partners on both sides um, looking to exploit what is probably one of the last oil and grand gas frontiers in the world today. Um, you know, clearly there is a lot of oil and gas in this area. This follows the system that runs all the way down to Mozambique. You've got Turkey ranged on the Somali side. You've got a number of European partners as well. Um, uh, you've got players like the UAE who've got, who've got a stake in the game. And then you've got Kenya's partners as well. So this is uh, not uh, a Kenya-Somali issue per se. It's got much wider ramifications um, than that. Kenya Mortgage Finance uh, Refinance Company, that's about $27.6 million they seem to have put to work. Um, this is where uh, Kenya is trying to encourage um, uh, a, a mortgage refinance situation in order to provide cheaper liquidity to the banks, so then expected to on lend it um, at cheaper rates. We have about 27,000 mortgage holders in Kenya. It's a very small number, um, and interest rates obviously very high. And this is uh, the determination by the government to stimulate mortgage borrowing and the housing market. Ethiopia, uh, the switch getting $2.3 million from the AFDB, um, we're seeing obviously this global trend of digitization and mobile money. Um, Ethiopia is not allowing Safaricom's M-Pesa to, to be a player as such. 
they're looking to put a moat around the mobile money scenario in Ethiopia. Um, but this speaks to the opportunity of a more than 100 million uh, people market. And uh, it's good to see the AFDB stepping up um, as they are prone to do. And uh, uh, this is a positive development. Finally, Mozambique, um, you know, I was in Maputo in 2012. The place was booming. The IMF held a conference there a year or so later. It was called Africa Rising. Then we had the bust. You remember the tuna boat story and uh, those funny loans that were made, which seemed to have gone to the ruling party. But, um, uh, you know, the, the opportunity in Mozambique is a big one. Um, the gas find there is second only to Qatar. And um, at some point, hopefully, they'll get on the right trajectory. And I think they've got a lot of hard work to do. And at least this is progress in that direction that they're looking to restructure these state-owned companies. Look, this is a disease across the continent. Our state-owned companies are probably the most poorly run companies. They would be so profitable if they were run, you know, with a bit of economic sense and not purely a political, uh, you know, remote control by typically the political regime. Um, and I genuinely hope that Mozambique can start reorganizing the state-owned sector because it's got such an important role to play um, in so many different ways and in job creation. I mean, you know, if they were working properly, they'd throw off a ton of jobs. Thank you very much, Ali, for helping us to understand all of these headlines. Bozen, you've got any comments to make? You've got a couple of uh, state-owned companies in Mozambique. I know you are with Ali on this issue. align with him when it comes to the issue of uh, Mozambique and, and what happens within the East African corridor. I'm very interested in the maritime dispute between Somalia and, uh, and Kenya, uh, but, but it's very good and I'm happy that Kenya has opted to have the African Union uh, handle this instead of the international court. Look, it is time for us in Africa to start taking our destiny in our own hands. If there's a dispute between two African countries, you say so it's within the African Union. That's what it is. If it's in Europe, they'll go to the uh, European Court of Arbitration or the European Court of Justice first. Everybody goes to the United States first. Between Germany and France, they won't head to the United States. Between Brussels and Bel Belgium, whatever. It is. They, they won't, or between uh, Belgium and, and the Netherlands or, or, or Norway. They'll go to the European Court for settlement first or arbitration or whatever. They will explore everything that they can do within the European judicial system before they ask the United Nations or to go to Washington. Nobody goes to Washington for everything. Excuse me. This is the time now for us to begin to believe in the structure. We can't set up the African Union with the mechanism for dispute resolution and everything, and we just ignore it and go straight to Brussels and go to Netherlands and go to whatever. No. This is the time we should have our own system and test it and make it work for ourselves. And whatever the, the adjudication wants, it is fair and, 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 and just. We should abide by it and move on. We thank you so much. African Bozen. mechanism itself to test. <clears throat> right, and thank you so much, Bosin, for that contribution. Uh, Ayode Jebo has just joined us from Chapel Hill, Benham, um, Advisory Bank. Ayode, thanks a great deal for coming through on the show this morning. Thanks, and that takes us to the Western African headlines we've got on our tray right here. The Central Bank of Nigeria's Monetary Policy Committee rates meeting is now being set for March the 22nd and 23rd, and that's next week. Central Bank also extends the deadline for the uh, RFP for Infraco Asset Management till March the 30th. That's something that was meant to end today, provenant today, but now got an extension of 15 days. Nigeria's unemployment rate raises to 33.3% in the fourth quarter of 2020. Nigeria's February 2021 CPI uh, report as inflation rates is expected to be released today as Bank of Ghana revises sanctions for the issuance of Dutch checks. Ivorian Seekable reports profits of 1.17 billion CEFA for the uh, 2020 uh, uh, calendar year. I'll come to you quickly first. Um, I can understand the demand for uh, some of these headlines. I mean, what are your expectations around the um, rates meeting that is expected next next week do you have any forecast and if you'd like to also speak to the unemployment rates you may combine the two or just choose one of the two thank you tempo um for the mpc um i do not admire their position as at this moment um we saw yesterday um the release of the employment data uh, which um 
which spiked to about 33.3%. Uh, that's, that is huge. And that's the MPC needs to take it, this into consideration in, um, the, in deciding whether they want to curtail inflation, which came in this morning at about 17.33. Uh, they want to be, um, they want to spoil, they want to keep spoiling the economy in terms of um, enabling growth um, and, 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 um, you know, competitiveness in terms of businesses um, in, in, in the environment or in the economy. Uh, because um, the, the, we've seen inflation um, spike uh, considerably uh, for the larger part of last year, and um, it has continued this year. And as well, um, just because we exited recession in Q4 2020, um, we were thinking that um, the, the MPC might, at this point, try to curtail inflation. But with the unemployment data that just came in, it shows that the economy is still very fragile and it's still very weak, and it needs um, some some stimulus and some support um, in terms of um, spoiling it out of out of the the, the, the COVID impacted um, the destruction that occurred um, across the econo across economies last year and um, in terms of in terms of unemployment it's if you look if you look at the numbers you see that um, the larger part of the working working uh, working uh, labor force um, which 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 is between um, those of um, 24 to about 34 um, years of age um, have about 57 of them do nothing or basically do little and um, this is a time bomb for Nigeria and um, it's no surprise that we've been seeing a whole lot of insecurity across the country because um, when you have um, about 30 Three percent of your of your workforce um doing little or nothing um it means that they have to resort to something they say the the idle mind is the, is the devil's workshop and that's what we are seeing and if the government doesn't take this ant on and if we do not take this as seriously as we ought to um it will mean that someday we'll be driving out of our homes to 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 the office and we'll be stopped by the road and asked to come down from our vehicles and trek um back home because um the the the, the, the people that um would see us as privileged would would will stand against us um, because unemployment is it's, it's a very a very drastic and is a very evil um, um, mechanism for even any country or any economy if we do not take it hands on if we not and um, treat this drastically um, it would it would keep spiking up and um, it would lead to to a, to a very drastic um, um, point for the for the country um, just to touch quickly on um, inflation. Um, if you look at the food index, it's no surprise really that um, for the food basket is what is driving inflation. Um, I will take it from the perspective of the trade data that we saw recently um, um, from, the, from the National Bureau of Statistics. About 11% uh, about 2.2 trillion of um, their 19.9 um, trillion imported um, goods um, were food related and um, beverage related and this would mean that um we are still largely dependent on importing a whole lot of a whole lot of what we consume and um this will continue to impact um inflation if you look at um, the devaluation we've been seeing and even the anticipatory inflation itself would mean that um, we'll continue to see this um this rate um spike upward right and thanks a great deal like it's in this the month that i mean the Data has actually just been released 17.33 percent all the way from 16 point something percent uh, it was the uh, nigeria's 2020 uh, 2021 february 2021 inflation rates at this point um core inflation is also 12.38 percent from 11.85 percent and you've got food inflation at 21.79 um from 20.57 percent in january um let me come to you are your day to help us make sense of this data um are you happy to this already mentioned the fact that we still Import a whole lot of uh, staples and coal, and of course, we've seen where Ghana in recent times beginning to uh, shift away from uh, exporting all of its cocoa to so Switzerland and a couple of other countries. They now want to start, you know, uh, tapping the entire value chain of that uh, uh, staple in that country. What help us to understand this data and uh, give us a sense of what we then need to start doing? I mean, to manage food inflation, which is very seriously uh, uh, escalated. Okay, thanks. Um, I think it's uh, when you look at the data, it's really very saddening. And because when you look at what inflation, the impact on inflation, the impact on investment, the impact on your savings, it's like an endless game. So I always like to put it into this perspective. If you are trying to save to buy a car within the next five years and inflation continues to move at 20%, 
and your salary is not increased or your rate of savings has not increased, it means that you will save into perpetuity to get that car. That's the impact. If you feel that you have, you are putting funds aside and you are trying to get some things in the future, inflation will continue to eat into the value. It impacts on the purchasing power, the ability to buy. And that is the very sad thing about inflation. So what should Nigerians do or how can Nigerians be able to bridge this? We need to, in Nigerians, we need to change our perspective in terms of preserving our wealth. You may need to, you know, there, when you look at um, CASA, when you look at the, the industry, you see a lot of Nigerians, comfort, they are comfortable leaving their funds in their savings and current accounts, any zero interest rates. And you see them trying to make ends meet. So it means that you need to change your strategy. There are, we know there's a lot that has to be done regarding investor education so that they can, even if you are moving, you can't cover inflation yet currently in Nigeria in terms of investments that are, that are with low risk, but you need to be able to bridge the gap. Now coming to the government, what can they do? Yes, you say, Aki today I rightly identified the food inflation, 21%. We all know the reason for this, and it has not been resolved, or we are not even in the process of resolving it. Insecurity. If we are unable to plant, then there's nothing to expect to harvest. Yes, borders have been opened, but we all know that there is also that impact of exchange rates because once the um, when you look at the prices from other countries, will be also linked to the dollar indirectly or directly so it will impact on the cost of those goods so i think the first step which is the fundamental step is for us to see how we want to tackle insecurity okay if we don't so that we can increase production yeah and yeah. as we increase production that would help bring down prices it's uh, simple economics demand and supply Let's hope the government listens to that advice. Uh, Boston, any quick comments uh, before we move to the Southern African space? Well, I have only one simple comment, and I want to relate what uh, the uh, CEO of one of the biggest uh, uh, com uh, com companies in Nigeria, Chairman, told me uh, about three, four years ago. And I want everybody to listen very carefully. Uh, and this is the Chairman of Kagal, which owns the Niger Dock uh, Island, which is called the Snake Island. And, and they were part of the building of the FPSO, the, the total FPSO, and it was, you know, they had about 3,000 workers there. But they had to start leading them off about three years, four years ago. And he told me, he said, look, Bosin, you know, I'm scared for Nigeria. He's a Lebanese, but a naturalized Nigerian Lebanese. And he said, look, Bosin, do you know the time is coming very soon when you and I will not be able to take our wives on weekends to a fancy, nice restaurant to have lunch. He said because of the level of unemployment in Nigeria, he said that you get to a point in which we will not be able to take our wives out to a decent restaurant for lunch. He said we'll be scared to go out of our homes. He said because the unemployment in Nigeria is so high. He said you and I wearing nice suits. He said but the time is coming very soon. We will not be able to take our wives out to lunch. And I was scared to enter my bone, my Lord just chilled with that particular statement from a foreigner in Nigeria. And that tells you exactly the point where we are and which I to make. the Same Thank you. Thanks a great deal, Bosa. And Ali has got a comment to add to this. Yes. Uh, so just adding to that point, you know, uh, I was listening to the African Development Bank uh, release on Friday. And in that release, they talk about downside factors that could derail the recovery, resurgence of COVID infections, debt overhang, financial market volatility, low commodity prices, low tourism and remittances, extreme weather events, and social tensions, which is the point I'm trying to re reference here, social tensions. Now, you know, you go and look at food prices, obviously you in Nigeria are an extreme example because bear in mind 21% inflation, food price inflation, reflects differently depending upon the size of your budget. 
21% food inflation when you're at a minimum wage is actually amplified. If you look back in history, you don't have to t- it's, you know you don't have to be a, re- a, 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 a a rocket scientist to see whenever food prices and food inflation starts to become extreme, as you as we are witnessing around the world today. FAO put out some research showing that uh, the food price index is around a nine or ten year high already. That's without the amplification you're seeing in Nigeria. You get very, very difficult situations for regimes. So I think, you know, it, you, uh, just what Boston is saying, what everybody has been saying, I think we're being very cavalier at the risks that are out there now. You know, it doesn't take much weather event or anything to tip this over the edge. And then we're going to be dealing with like a, a black spring, not an Arab spring. The Arab spring, you remember famously, um, uh, one of the big triggers was the price of bread. Thanks a great deal, both uh, Ali, for that contribution. Thank you, gentlemen, for all of these your analysis. Let's look, quickly finish off with the Southern African markets and the Northern African headlines with South Africa first, where Mr. Price is looking to repurchase or to purchase one hundred percent Egypt share capital of UPCF. Uh, you've got Pabsa saying that there's no prof- there's no dividend as profits dipped by fifty eight percent this uh, final this last calendar year. And you have SA fintech startup Adumo raising some two hundred and twenty five million uh, rands from uh, IFC. Another company raising money from IFC. And let me come to you, Ali, with this headline before I get the, uh, the analysis of another researcher here. Apologies. Just quickly to go through your headlines. Uh, Sun International, of course, is the famous Salt Kersner, um, uh, uh, who, of course, built uh, up Sun International and um, uh, obviously down 49% uh, simply because there was barely any tourism in South Africa last year. They'll be hoping for a rebound. ABSA, look, everyone's sort of focusing on ABSA, the fact that they've skipped the dividend, the fact that profit dipped 58%. But ABSA was the most aggressive about writing down last year of every South African bank. And therefore, you're going to see a much more dramatic recovery in earnings in ABSA versus its peers. So in a way, these results are backward-looking. And you had that uh, uh, delinkaging uh, with Barclays, which also was pretty expensive and lumpy. So once you look through that, I would say to people, ABSA looks like an interesting prospect to me. I think they were the most aggressive in writing down last year, and therefore will have more room to write up this year. And if I can finally turn on the story of Namibia Breweries, profit dropping 46.3%. Look, this is the result of lockdowns that we saw last year. People weren't were under curfew, under lockdown, weren't going out drinking. Same thing has happened here in Kenya. And really, I think, you know, if you're looking at the breweries, the brewery companies across the continent, you've got to be modeling um, the COVID curve, because if you get another spike, and we're currently in a third wave here in Nairobi, for example, and I'm seeing it's, it's spiking up in Ethiopia, in Madagascar, and a few other places um, on the west coast, or west side of Africa, Guinea, Cameroon, Ivory Coast are all near record highs. It's just a South African number that's depressing the overall picture for now. But if you look at that, then you've got to be a little bit more concerned than maybe the headline numbers tell you. Thanks a great deal, Ali, for that. Uh, I can tell you, you've got one minute to address uh, the, the possibility of a company not paying dividend when you have lots of shareholders expecting reward for the having waited for 12, 12 months. I mean, um, a, lo- a, lo- a lot of investors actually, or a lot of shareholders, look at dividend as um, a, a pivotal income. Um, for investment and um, at the point where you're not making those payments when due or when um, when expected uh, what you see is a plunge a huge plunge in your share prices and um, we, uh, a typical example uh, a typical example is is um is is, is uba um you see uba in nigeria uh, they, they 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 had um, a considerably fair performance for the year um you see the eps settled stronger than um we, we witnessed last year uh, but uh, in 2019, but um, we the, the, the dividend declared um, 
dividend payout was drastically um, lower than what um, was done in the in, in the prior year. So um, this led to um, investors' pe pessimism on the, on those stocks, and um, they, they subsequently sold off the holdings. Makes a great deal. I mean, it's something that is quite disappointing to investors. We all know that. Let's start to finish off now with the Northern African headlines we've heard before. As for example, bank announcing some $350 million loan for Morocco OCP Group. Uh, Egypt plans to produce 7.2 billion uh, cubic feet of natural gas a day in 2021-2022. Calendar year starting in July. And you've got uh, the uh, Raya, subsidi Raya subsidiary. A man it's to now issue some uh, 600 million Egyptian pounds securitization uh, bond. Help us to understand these headlines, please, um, Ali, before we get the perspectives of IOD. Uh, so, can I just skip those headlines and give you one other headline that came across my screen just now? Oh, Egypt, sure, please go ahead, Ali. Egypt has raised its minimum wage to the same level as Tunisia. This announcement was made earlier this morning. Um, normally, Egypt does that every five years. This time, they've done it after 24 months. And again, I think it was the best performing economy in Africa last year, 3.6% GDP growth. And there is this trade-off, of course, between uh, the political repression and the economic uh, issue. But overall, you see uh, there the fruits of the economic reforms under Sisi's government being delivered at the bottom of the pyramid. And I think, you know, um, it, I have to credit Egypt. We've credited them before. But to me, that is a direct consequence of what types of things they've done, which frankly started in 2015 with the devaluation of the currency. Okay. The freed up the whole space. Thanks a great deal for that, Ali. Uh, one minute for you, uh, Ayodeji, to speak to this uh, headlines. Maybe you want to speak to uh, the implications of Egypt planning to produce 7.2 billion cubic feet of gas. Uh, I mean, that Nigeria has also found a way to diversify to that level. I, th I think. Uh Egypt has is uh, has always been in the forefront, and there are a lot of um, um, models to copy up from Egypt. We know the renewable energy; they are doing very well within that space. Now we have been talking a lot about diversification into gas. Um, their PIB bill is gathering dust. Uh, we've not been able to successfully pass that. So I believe that it's um, it's important. Gas is the next big thing, uh, as we see with the um, advent or the adoption of, um, of um, energy vehicles, uh, they we, we expect that they will, in the short to medium term, there will be reduction in the use of, of, um, of petrol or of crude oil. So I believe that um, it's a right step in the right direction. Appreciate that analysis, Ayodeji Ebo. Thank you so much for joining us from Chapel Hill, Benham Advisory Bank. Appreciate your perspectives on the show this morning. Ali Kansaju of Rich Frontiers Management, Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you so much for your analysis as well. Akitunde Suleiman, we appreciate your presence on the show. He joined us from uh, Greenwich Merchant Bank. Thanks a great deal for your perspectives. Uh, Bosin, in absentia, thank you to Bosin Amofaye, Executive Editor at Frontier Africa Reports. We lost this connection earlier. Uh, gentlemen, we appreciate your insights on the program this morning. This has been Frontier Opening Bell for this Tuesday. I'm Temple Ashadu. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.